Okay, good afternoon everyone. We can, uh, we can get started. You're all here for the talk about peep titration, right? Because when I talk about this, it's not usually standing room only. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, PEEP is a complex topic. So I don't know that we finally know the answer on how to titrate PEEP. But I want to suggest a number of considerations for, for you as you do this at the bedside. And I think this is meant to be quite interactive. So please, by all means, uh, put your hand up and interrupt me with your questions, your thoughts, your comments, violent disagreement. Uh, this is meant for us to learn from each other about, uh, about a challenging problem in mechanical ventilation at the bedside. All right, so these are my disclosures, some funding interests, some um, research support and consulting fees, uh, but nothing really specifically related to, uh, to PEEP management. All right, so, so when we're applying PEEP at the, at the bedside, we're really uh, primarily aiming to protect the lung from injury. Of course, we're also trying to maintain adequate lung volume, prevent atelectasis, to minimize shunt fraction, to ensure adequate gas exchange. But everything we've learned from 20, 30, 40 years of trials in our field seems to suggest that gas exchange is not really what saves a patient's life or not really what determines their outcome primarily as much as, as lung injury. And so there's been a huge amount of time and effort invested in trying to think about, okay, how can I apply PEEP to protect the lung? And when we think about protecting the lung with PEEP, there's really probably three different, at least theoretical mechanisms of lung injury that are important for us to bear in mind to understand uh, as we, as we uh, set, set the ventilators. The first one is opening and closing of um, atelectatic lung regions, so-called atelect trauma. The idea being that the cyclic repetitive opening and closing of lung, lung units adjacent to the border of the baby lung results in very high shear stresses and that by increasing the pressure at end expiration, we prevent those airways from collapsing and hence prevent the propagation of injury and shear stress along the alveolar wall. The uh, second mechanism, and I'm gonna uh, probably focus on this mostly because I'm personally convinced that it's the most relevant, is trying to minimize stress and strain within the injured lung. And we'll talk a bit more about what that means, but essentially the idea is that by maximizing the number of units, lung units available for participation of ventilation, we can minimize the stress that each individual unit appear, uh, experiences during tidal inflation and thereby reduce the risk of lung injury. Then there's this kind of very theoretical uh, concept of stress raisers. The idea of stress raisers is that you've got local inhomogeneity, so small regions of the lung that are collapsed with open areas of lung immediately around, and the kind of interesting physics and biomechanics of local inhomogeneities in uh, the lung parenchyma is that those local inhomogeneities function as stress multipliers or stress raisers, and if those exist in tissue, when the regions that are inflated around the stress raisers, they experience up to five times the stress they would experience if the stress raise, if the collapsed inhomogeneous region was actually open. So this is thought to be possibly a mechanism by which regional or um, regional inhomogeneities can, can contribute to uh, lung injury. So again, by recruiting those regions, by improving the homogeneity of the distribution of ventilation, the idea is that we can prevent lung injury. So that's, this is the theory. Now, all of this, of course, is contingent upon the response of the lung to the increase in pressure, what we call recruitability. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit of detail as well. But I want to emphasize this one thing that all of you, whether it's sit, sitting, standing, uh, walk out of here uh, in 25 minutes that, uh, that you should have in your mind is that fundamentally our task is to understand how the lung has responded 
to the change in pressure that we're applying. And if we understand the response, we probably have quite a good idea about whether it's helping the patient or not. The problem, of course, is this whole notion of heterogeneity of treatment effect. And if you guys were in the op any of you were in the opening session this morning, you'll have heard me already speak about this briefly. Um, this issue that some patients respond favorably to an increase in positive end expiratory pressure and some don't. And part of our challenge in previous trials of higher versus lower PEEP strategies is that we haven't done a very good job of selecting out the responders and the non-responders. And I think clinicians intuitively know that some patients have a favorable response and some don't. Perhaps the failure has been to build that clinical intuition into the trial design, into the way that higher and lower PEEP strategies are designed. But this is, this is basically what makes PEEP complicated. Not everybody responds favorably and therefore we have to take a more individualized approach to setting uh, this aspect of mechanical ventilation. It's not just as easy as six mils per kilo for everybody, although I'd argue that that's probably wrong-headed as well. So when we talk about recruitability, what do we mean exactly? Well, I find these CT images sort of helpful to visualize the concept of recruitability. This is from a, a famous paper by Luciano Gattinoni published in the New England Journal in 2006, which really, I think, opened our eyes to the variability among patients in terms of their anatomical and biomechanical response to PEEP. So these are CT scan images, obviously, uh, showing in cross-section, patient with a uh, lower percentage of potentially recruitable lung and a higher percentage of potentially recruitable lung. And what you see here in the top panel is you've got a patient with a, a comparatively small amount of atelectasis at five centimeters of water. And then at 45 centimeters of water, which nobody's suggesting that you apply that much pressure, by the way, uh, the, uh, you can see that the kind of atelectasis distribution and, 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 and volume has hardly changed at all. So this is a patient who's not recruiting in response to an increase in PEEP. By contrast, this patient here with a higher per percentage of potentially recruitable lung, you can see a relatively larger volume of atelectasis. And at the high uh, PEEP level, you see much of this, those lung regions are now well aerated. So you've got a whole series of collapsed uh, lung units, ACE and I, composed of multiple alveoli, which as a consequence of edema, the effects of gravity on the lung, uh, changes in surface tension, it's a complicated phenomenon. But nevertheless, this predisposition to collapse develops in the dorsal lung regions. And in this case, you increase the pressure and the lung just opens up beautifully like a, like a, a whole range of balloons in parallel that you're, that you're blowing up. And so uh, in theory, uh, we, we think this is a favorable response, whereas this is unfavorable. But of course, we're not doing CTs most of the time, maybe some of you are, uh, to set PEEP. And so the question is, how do we uh, have an assessment along these lines at the bedside? So the critical concept I want you to be able to visualize very easily when you're thinking about setting PEEP is this idea of strain. And a strain is basically the change in size of a lung unit in response to tidal inflation as a function of its baseline size. Okay, so imagine you uh, have a lung and, um, or you have a patient with a lung and, they're at, and you apply a PEEP of zero. The resulting end expiratory lung volume would be the functional residual capacity, would be at functional residual capacity. Now what you do is you apply a PEEP of 10 and you're increasing the lung volume above FRC to a new end expiratory lung volume that's increased to some extent. And then what you're doing is you're applying a tidal volume on top of this. And the tidal volume uh, introduces what we call dynamic strain. So the increase in lung volume from FRC is what you might call static strain because that's sort of constant. And then dynamic strain is this idea that there's a, a, a stress or strain that occurs within the lung at every breath. And the magnitude of that strain is essentially the, the ratio between tidal volume and end expiratory lung volume. Um, now, the, the beauty of respiratory physiology is that with a ventilator, we can actually put numbers on this. So uh, 
the specific elastance of healthy lung at FRC is 12, or sorry, specific, uh, gosh, I'm going to get this all mixed up now. Specific elastance, I believe it's 12 centimeters of water per liter. Um, and so the, what, what that means is you can basically estimate the strain that you're causing by this relationship between the pressure that results from the tidal volume. This is why the driving pressure is a very informative measurement because it directly reflects the strain that you're applying to the lung. So if you want to take the lung from FRC to double FRC, you would apply 12 centimeters of water. And if you want to triple, and so that would be a strain ratio of one. So you've increased lung volume by a factor of one relative to its baseline. The threshold at which lung injury starts to occur is thought to be something in the range of a strain ratio of 1.5. So this would mean involve increasing, applying a pressure of 18 centimeters of water or more would, would give you a strain ratio of approximately 1.5. Um, so I'm trying to give you a, a, a feel, a kind of quantitative feel at the bedside of the relationship between the, the pressures that you're measuring on the ventilator and the strain that you're applying within the lung. So anyways, this, is, this, is, this figure here is really meant to help you visualize the concept of strain. The dynamic strain is the increase in, in lung volume and tissue stretch consequent to the tidal volume, and it's a, a quantity that's relative to the baseline volume. So now let's suppose you have a patient with lung recruitability. You you're at a PEEP of zero, and then you apply a PEEP of 10, but instead of, um, instead of uh, all that pressure going into one lung unit, the increase in PEEP leads to the recruitment of a new lung unit to participate in ventilation. So you effectively, in this kind of hypothetical scenario, have doubled the number of lung units available to participate in tidal ventilation. Now, when you apply the same tidal volume, it's getting distributed between two, uh, two lung units. And so now that because now what the PEEP is doing is in, rather than increasing static strain, it's decreasing static strain and it's decreasing dynamic strain because you have more lung units participating in ventilation. Okay, so this is the key kind of physical concept. The whole point of increasing PEEP in ARDS, I would posit, is to increase the number of lung units participating in ventilation so that dynamic strain is reduced. That's, that's the whole goal from a physiological standpoint. Now, do we have any kind of evidence that suggests that this is good for the lung? We don't have clinical trial evidence, but we do have a lot of physiological evidence. And I, I, I really like this figure because I, I find it actually helped me to really visualize how, how PEEP could be a, a good thing uh, for the injured lung. So on the x-axis here, you've got uh, progressively higher levels of PEEP. And then on the y-axis, you have this MRI-based measurement called the apparent diffusion coefficient. This is ventilation imaging. Wouldn't worry too much about apparent diffusion coefficient, except to say that its interpretation or its meaning is the acinar size in aerated lung. It tells you basically how big each individual lung unit is. Um, essentially, the more diffusion that's going on, the more the room there is for molecules to move around. So it tells you about acinar size. So in a healthy lung, if you increase the PEEP, what you see is that acinar size increases, uh, um, which is not totally surprising because you know PEEP inflates the lung. But in the injured lung, with lavage and then lavage plus surfactant, what you see is as PEEP increases, you have actually a progressive decrease in acinar size. So this is PEEP doing its job. It's, re it's reducing the size of individual inflated lung acini to reduce stress and strain. That's really what we're trying to do. Now, of course, this is a very recruitable model, lavage with surfactant restoration. This is like the sine qua non of a uh, highly recruitable experimental model. So of course you're going to see this kind of physiological improvement, but what you don't want to do is have an injured lung where the acinar size of baseline is much, much higher because of all the collapsed lung units that are not participating in ventilation. And then you turn up the PEEP and further increase acinar size. That would be a bad uh, response. That would further exacerbate stress and strain. So this is really what we're trying to avoid.
and try to target when we're titrating the peep. So, you know, actually, for a long time, we've known about this kind of variability in response to uh, increases in, in airway pressure. This is a, now a very old study from uh, Grasso and colleagues where they basically applied lung recruitment maneuver to a series of ARDS patients that showed that basically you could pick out responders and non-responders based on their physiological response. So responders had a significant improvement in oxygenation, uh, a significant uh, reduction in elastance. And what a, a reduction in elastance entails is an increase in lung volume. And, um, and you can see that that's what they measured here, the, the volume of recruited lungs. So if you see this kind of gas exchange and mechanical response, that's a very encouraging sign that you're reducing stress and strain within the lung and protecting lung units from, from potential injury. Now, this is all nice physiology and the cr criticism of physi physiology in general, and I think it's generally reasonably warranted, is that it doesn't actually tells us, tell us what actually happens to our patient. So a, a favorable physiological response does not necessarily entail a favorable clinical outcome response. Unless, of course, the physiological response reflects the mechanism that drives the clinical outcome. And so I want to show you a couple of studies that I've been involved in where we looked at this relationship between the physiological response and the clinical outcome. And while these still aren't of the same quality of evidence as, say, a randomized trial, they provide encouraging support for the idea that the physiological response to PEEP is very relevant to the patient's outcome. So this slide here is from a reanalysis of the LOVES uh, trial, which was a randomized trial of higher versus lower PEEP strategy. And what we looked at was the relationship between the gas exchange response, the PF change, and uh, following randomization and the patient's uh, risk of death. So the patients had you know, a blood gas obtained right before they were randomized. And then within 60 minutes or so after randomization, the blood gas was obtained again. So we were able to measure this PF response to the changes in PEEP after randomization fairly quickly. So we have kind of a, a, a well-defined physiological response to the changes in PEEP. And the first thing that, uh, that's pretty striking is that the correlation between the change in PEEP following randomization and the change in oxygenation is very, very weak, right? So you see here, you've got patients who have, uh, an, some of them have increases in PEEP after randomization of 10 centimeters of water, and their PF actually goes down significantly. You've got other patients here whose uh, PF, uh, or the PEEP is actually decreased after randomization, and their PF actually goes up a little bit. So this suggests that there's, this kind of is consistent with this idea. There's a lot of heterogeneity and how patients respond to a change in PEEP uh, related to a, a PEEP titration strategy. And the, uh, the figure on the right here is really the critical figure. So what you have is the relationship between the, the change in PF following uh, ran randomization and change in PEEP stratified according to whether there was an increase in PEEP, which is the kind of magenta line, and there, or whether there was the PEEP was decreased or unchanged after randomization, the, the, the blue line. And what you see for among patients whose PEEP was increased after randomization, this really striking correlation between the oxygenation response to PEEP and the risk of death. So patients whose uh, PF improved uh, within an hour of randomization had a much, much lower mortality than patients whose uh, PF uh, worsened after an increase in PEEP. And uh, this suggests, doesn't confirm, but suggests that perhaps the, the response to PEEP is critical in determining whether or not an increase in PEEP is beneficial or not. Patients who don't have a favorable oxygenation response, in general, those are the patients who you're failing to recruit. And so uh, they may well have a worse outcome. Now, it's impossible to say here whether this relationship is causal in the sense that the, that the the worse mortality is a consequence of the increase in PEEP. That again is something we'd have to embed in a trial, but this is really uh, qu quite suggestive that there's an important relationship between response to PEEP and the clinical outcome. Now we, we actually decided to look at this uh, uh, 
relation again in a similar analysis of uh, other higher versus lower PEEP trials. So this paper is a, l a bit more recent by Nadir Yeya and colleagues um, in collaboration with myself and others. And what we looked at again was we looked at a different trial, the alveoli trial. And the first thing we wanted to see is, do we see this relationship between PF response and change in PEEP in a different trial? And yes, again, we found the same relationship. But what was also quite striking is that the change in driving pressure after uh, a change in PEEP also seems to be strongly correlated to uh, mortality. So if a patient had a reduction in driving pressure after randomization, well, their risk of death was markedly lower than a patient who had an increase in driving pressure after randomization and an increase in PEEP. So again, uh, this is not causal evidence. This is not um, uh, baseline measurements obtained before randomization. This is pre and post randomization. But again, it's tantalizingly suggestive that there's a strong relationship between physiological response and clinical outcome. And it suggests to me that, you know, in the absence of clinical trials that um, show benefit or harm from such a strategy, it, it makes a ton of sense for us as clinicians at the bedside to be carefully monitoring how our patients respond to a higher versus lower PEEP strategy. Now there's one other physiological tool that uh, we can use to assess how the lung responds to PEEP. And this was described by Laurent Richard's group, um, Lu Chen and colleagues. This is a, a parameter called the recruitment inflation ratio that many of you will have heard of. And it's really very, very simple to measure at the bedside. The idea here is that um, if, you, if you're operating at a PEEP of 15 and you know the compliance at a PEEP of 15 and then you would, then you'll, based on the tidal volume that you obtain at a PEEP of 15, and then you reduce the PEEP by 10, if the exhaled volume associated with that reduction in, uh, in PEEP is larger, than the, than the tidal volume at the previous PEEP level, assuming you're applying a pressure control of 10, well then you actually, what, what that suggests that you're actually uh, de-recruiting as you've reduced the PEEP. So the, math, the math is slightly complicated, but the good news is, is that there's lots of calculators that you can use where you just input the measurements of tidal volume and PEEP before and after the reduction in, in PEEP. That makes it very, very easy. And so the recruitment inflation ratio is thought to be a very simple physiological tool for establishing whether or not a higher PEEP is associated with recruitment of additional lung units to participate in ventilation. So this is a very, very nice, uh, this is an important advance in, uh, in our ability to assess lung mechanics at the bedside. And there's been quite a number of studies now that have shown that uh, it correlates to CT-based measurements of recruitment and, and other techniques as well. Uh, last year, we published this uh, network meta-analysis, which was basically a, a summary of the literature available on the different strategies for titrating for PEEP at the bedside. And one of the advantages of network meta-analysis is that it allows you to draw comparisons between strategies, even if those strategies haven't been tested head-to-head -head in a single randomized trial. So it can be a very informative way of saying, okay, there's many different, many different ways of, of titrating PEEP that have been described. And, uh, and we want to basically stack them all up head to head and see what the evidence suggests about how to go about, uh, how to go about titrating PEEP. And these are basically the key findings of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the results. So the, probably the most important finding is that if you compare a higher PEEP titration strategy that does not involve a lung recruitment maneuver in comparison to a lower PEEP titration strategy, that's almost certainly on average beneficial in patients with mild, moderate, or severe ARDS. So a higher PEEP strategy should be our default in the management of uh, ARDS. Now, one of the challenges, of course, is, well, you asked me, what do you mean by a higher PEEP titration strategy? And th this has been done in multiple ways. So anytime you do an analysis like this, you have, probably have to lump multiple 
strategies together. But a good example of uh, a higher peep titration strategy without a long recruitment maneuver would be the approach used in the express trial, where the, um, peep, the tidal volume is set to six mils per kilo, and then the peep is adjusted to achieve a plateau pressure of 28 to 30 centimeters of water. So it's a very simple approach that uh, has a strong uh, evidence base behind it uh, as, as, as likely beneficial. Another approach would be a PEEP F, higher PEEP FiO2 table like that used in the, in the alveoli trial or the LOVES trial. But what was important was when we compared um, higher PEEP titration strategies uh, without a long recruit maneuver to higher PEEP titration strategies with a prolonged long recruitment maneuver, such as the very aggressive approach employed in the ART trial, you see that these, these strategies associated with a long, prolonged long recruitment maneuver, they're probably harmful. So I've actually completely changed my tune because I used to be a big believer in lung recruitment maneuvers. And this evidence suggests that we probably should generally avoid them unless we're using them as a kind of acute rescue strategy for a, for a very hypoxemic patient. So the standard approach, probably best to employ a higher PEEP strategy without a lung recruitment maneuver. There is a, a, a kind of intriguing signal in favor of an esophageal manometry based approach, which I haven't really talked about too much here, but I think very much this remains a subject of ongoing need for research and could still potentially be uh, a beneficial type of PEEP titration strategy in the future. But for now, I think uh, it's best to confine that to, uh, to clinical trials. Um, and so th those are probably the most important findings from the, uh, from the network meta-analysis. Now, and a critical limitation of clinical trials in general and meta-analyses in particular is that they're a massive lumping exercise. And none of the, what I'm presenting to you on this slide attends to any of what all I just talked about in terms of physiological responsiveness. So one of the challenges that we have as thoughtful clinicians is to integrate everything we know from physiology with everything we know from the so-called evidence base. And so I would suggest that, um, that our challenge is to integrate these findings with also a knowledge of what my PEEP is doing to a patient. So if my default is to use a higher PEEP titration strategy and I turn up the PEEP and I'm finding, oh, the oxygenation is not improving at all and the driving pressure is four centimeters of water higher, I personally think it'd be irresponsible of me to continue applying a higher PEEP titration strategy, whatever the evidence says. And so I think there is a real place for us applying what we know from physiology as well as what we know from, uh, from meta-analyses. Now, I know some might vehemently disagree with me about that. And if you're in the room, please speak up after I'm done. Um, all right. I, I did want to make a brief comment about the role of PEEP in the management of spontaneous breathing, because I think this is a, an emerging an important area, and I think the role of PEEP in the management of spontaneous breathing is actually somewhat underappreciated. So one of my main research priorities is the concept of lung and diaphragm protective ventilation. The idea being if we can have patients breathing spontaneously using their diaphragm, uh, then we can prevent diaphragm atrophy and weakness and potentially accelerate liberation from the ventilator. But the big challenge to doing that is that many patients have exhibit, once you get them breathing spontaneously, they have excessive respiratory effort and excessive lung distending pressure as a consequence of that. So we're not really being very lung protective, even if we're being diaphragm protective. So the challenge is to do both at the same time. And in this, uh, this uh, small uh, pilot clinical trial, we found that PEEP is actually incredibly, can, can be in some patients, incredibly useful at achieving those goals together. But the critical issue again is the physiological response. So, um, if uh, we divided the patients according to whether uh, an increase in PEEP from 8 to 15 improved uh, the dynamic lung compliance or um, worsened the, the uh, dynamic lung compliance. And what you find is that when the PEEP level is associated with an improvement in, in dynamic lung compliance, you have much more effective control of respiratory effort and lung distending pressure. So one of the things that we have to do in a spontaneously breathing patient is to assess the respiratory mechanical response to PEEP. And if a patient's lung mechanics improve as you turn up the PEEP, their respiratory effort will actually reduce and their lung distending pressure will reduce. You'll have effective control of lung stress, 
with spontaneous breathing. But many patients don't have that favorable response. Many patients actually have a worsening of lung compliance with higher PEEP during spontaneous breathing. And that, of course, will only make the problem with respiratory effort and lung distending pressure worse. So again, if you're going to use PEEP to effectively optimize spontaneous breathing, again, it's about assessing and monitoring the physiological response. Okay, so I see I'm out of time to wrap up. Um, uh, here's my practical approach. So uh, the first thing to do is to test for PEEP responsiveness. And that involves basically a test dose of PEEP, increasing the PEEP from you know, a lower level to a higher level where hopefully the increase in, in PEEP between the levels will be at least eight to 10 centimeters of water. And what I wanna know is, is there, are the mechanics improving? Is the oxygenation improving? I can measure the respiratory effort with a PEOC maneuver. Does that improve? And you can also then measure the recruitment inflation ratio by, uh, by decreasing the PEEP. And in responders, I think, it's, I think the evidence supports the use of a higher PEEP strategy. I think it's probably safer to use lower PEEP in patients who are not responders. Importantly, I think we should avoid lung recruitment maneuvers unless we need them as a, as a kind of rescue strategy for refractory hypoxemia. And I would encourage you where possible to enroll your patient in a clinical trial so that we can continue to advance the field. And um, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, support uh, the CAVIARDS trial, which is being run by Laurent Burchard and colleagues to test a, a PEEP titration strategy based on the recruitment inflation ratio, which I think will be very informative. So thank you for your attention.